So what is it that makes our everyday world so obvious to us? What is the obviousness of the everyday world? That's what phenomenology, according to Merleau-Ponty here, is going to look into. And that's what prior philosophies and sciences have just left unquestioned. Now, ph phenomenology has caused a lot of hubbub in Europe around the time uh, that Merleau-Ponty was writing this in the 1940s, but people have a hard time understanding it. Uh, even back then, um, phenomenology, people found it very hard to understand. One of the problems with phenomenology that people had a hard time understanding was, well, it seems like it's rejecting the life world. We're supposed, as phenomenologists, we're supposed to sort of um, re retreat into our inner sort of consciousness and introspect. So we're kind of rejecting the life world, but at the same time, the subject matter of it seems to be the life world. So what's going on there? And again, Merleau-Ponty is suggesting the tension there, rather than being a reason to reject phenomenology, is just what it, what's so important about phenomenology. So he suggests in this particular passage that I have on the screen that phenomenology is a style of being rather than a set doctrine. So if you have a set doctrine and there's tensions, uh, contradictions, inconsistencies in it, that's one reason to think this doctrine doesn't make any sense. But if you're thinking of phenomenology as a style of being, a style of seeing, then the tensions are, are sort of what are rich in them. They're, that, that's what needs to be explored. Just like if you go to, say, a psychologist and there's some tensions in the way you're, you're doing things, inconsistencies, that's, what, that's the fruit for the psychologist. That's what needs to be explored. So if we think of phenomenology as a style, then these tensions aren't problems, but so much as the rich sort of three-dimensionality of it. So we have to take on this style before we can fully understand it. We can't just expect it, phenomenology to be a doctrine that we could list out one, two, three, four, here are the theses, here are the theorems, here are the assumptions. That's just not the way phenomenology works. We need to take on this style, live with the tension, live with this confusion, and that will be something very fruitful for us. Um, So what is it that phenomenology studies? Well, we've made some references to the life world. He's, here he says, the entire universe of science is constructed upon the lived world. And if we wish to think science rigorously to appreciate precisely its sense and its scope, we must first awaken that experience of the world of which science is the second order expression. So lots going on here. He's saying, he's first of all, he's indicating that Part of what um, phenomenology is doing is studying these questions here. What, why is science something possible for human beings? Why is science something we can do? What makes science possible? We can imagine living in a world where there couldn't be any science, say a world of total chaotic flux. Why is the world not that way? Why is it possible to make progress in knowledge and science? Um, so what is the sense of science? What is it doing? And what are its limits? So what is the unity of science? How can we think of science all in one go and, and, and under, come to understand where it begins and ends? So by saying that the universe of science is constructed upon the lived world, he's talking, he's, he's referencing here Husserl's notion of the life world. And this was the, the reading that we had for the final reading of Husserl uh, about the life world. We didn't actually, we weren't able to meet uh, to, to lecture on that and discuss that. So I'll give a little bit of an overview of it right now. The life world is the world that remains, if you just take all the scientific theories that you know, from physics to psychology to mathematics, Everything that you've ever learned in school about those sorts of topics, just suspend that, bracket that, take no use of that. The life world is what remains. It's the world where 
you hurry to lunch. It's the world where your friend is angry at you. It's the world where um, the alarm clock is, is ringing much too soon. It's the world where you elbow bump rather than handshake these days. That's the life world, the world where your life takes place, um, pre-theoretically, not theorized by science whatsoever. And for Husserl, the life world appears to us in a certain way. So right now, the, the computer monitor that you're listening to this on is appearing to you, right? But it's not just individual things like that, the book, the monitor, the bicycle that appear to you. It's the life world as a whole somehow appears to you. Um, and how so? Well, it's part of the horizon, or it is the horizon in which you live. It's the thing that's always kind of further on. Uh, it's the horizontal backdrop for our experiences. So we've gone over the horizon. As you watch the lecture video on, this, on the computer screen that you're looking at, you don't simply see the screen. You see it, the screen embedded in an environment the wall behind the screen, uh, you hear the birds chirping in the distance, and you know that the wall is in the apartment complex, and the apartment complex is in some city, and the city is in some state, and on and on and on, all of that, you know you could uh, keep walking. If you went outside and just kept walking, more world would be revealed to you. So in this way, the, the, the horizon stretches out into a life world a world where things have meaning. The computer screen isn't a mere sort of uh, colored rectangle. It's the thing that helps you get on the internet. It's the thing that's, you know, um, a better monitor than your friend's monitor or the thing that costs you $200 or the thing that is very valuable to you in some way or another and so on and so forth. So the life world doesn't only include the material objects that we interact with. Um, it's your whole surrounding environment, including things like values. Um, you think the usefulness of tools, um, the social aspects, what your friends will think about something. That's part of your environment. It's not merely the sort of physical environment. So all of that is built into this concept of the life world. In short, it's the pre-scientific world of individual experience. Before we've thought of the world as a bunch of subatomic particles, or before we've break, broken it down into kingdoms and phyla, different animals and different life forms, it's just the way we interact with the world as we find it. So, what does it mean to say that the universe of science is constructed upon the lived world, and that science is the second order expression of our experience of the world? Well, it means Science doesn't say, you know, you, you'll hear some people say, well, the world is, a math, is mathematical. And that's exactly what this is speaking against. The world isn't a mathematical manifold. The world is the life world where you handshake people and where the alarm clock is going off too early and where things are noisy, right? It's not a world of waves and particles. That's a second order expression. Right? We, we see things, we experience the world, and then we kind of go one level of higher in abstraction. So thinking about the world as, say, math in mathematical terms is a higher order ex ex abstraction from the life world. The life world is the real deal, not the mathematical model of it. So what comes about before any science, any math can come? Well, perception of the life world. That's what comes first. So that's why Merleau-Ponty has called his book Phenomenology of Perception. And so perception and the life world are going to be the subject matter of phenomenology.